And uh, next on our program is Marquita Tucker. I said it right. You did on your side. Well, I'm on the radio. I'll say it by name. Well, and it just you can hear them both. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Mar Marquita is a co-organizer for the Black Non-Believers in Detroit. Yeah, yeah. She is the mother of four children, a senior IT business analysis uh, analyst for a auto financial company, a writer, ooh, entrepreneur, and a fledgling drummer. Please, y'all, give her a drum roll of a welcome. Homicides often occur after there has been many chances 
um, to physically or legally intervene, and um, abuse and the violence has already escalated. Um, we talked about this earlier, um, religious and culture-based violence against women, forced marriage, honor killings or honor abuse, um, and female genital mutilation. Two, actually, two years ago, back in my hometown, Detroit, um, an emergency room doctor, Dr. Jumana Nargawala, she was charged with performing female genital mutilation on nine girls in a suburban Detroit clinic. Others were charged with assisting her. Some of the girls were as young as seven years old. Wow. Yeah. So, like, this is not a thing that doesn't happen. It just happened where I live in the United States. This, I like this graphic, I found it online. Um, this just highlights some of the similarities. It's probably too small to read, but you know, if you want it, I can send it to you. But it's just a lot of parallels between uh, an, abu an abusive relationship and religion. You know, abusive men commonly refer to several different parts of the Bible. Um, the doctrine that is most commonly and controversially cited by um, abusers is male headship. Um, where he, the husband is to be the head of the wife in the marriage and the wife is to submit and men are to be the head of the church. Often, religiously, divorce is not an option. We all know that. Children and domestic violence. Many children are exposed to violence in the home um, and are also victims of the abuse. Children who witness violence between parents may also be at greater risk of being violent in their future relationships, unfortunately. So quickly, just spotting the signs of abuse. We know this. Some of the indicators may be that they withdraw from themselves. They stop socializing. Um, they seem nervous or frightened all the time, a little jumpy. Their partner gets jealous a lot. It's always checking on them, always calling. Um, their partner belittles them in public. That's the thing that happens. Um, and they have unexplained injuries, um, and they really, really cover up. They're always trying to cover up. Um, if you're worried that someone you know um, is being abused, try talking to them about what's happening. If they'll open up to you, encourage them to seek help and let them know that, you know, where help is available. Okay, having the conversation. Ask someone whether they are suffering from abuse. They're more likely to admit it to you than um, waiting for, you know, you waiting for them to say something. Um, always have the conversation face to face and make sure that you're in a safe space where you won't be overheard. Some of the points that get across, um, let them know that you believe them. This nice. Uh, reassure them that abuse, that the abuse is not their fault. Um, let them know that you want to help, and please let them know that abusers rarely change. There's nothing that they're going to do that's going to make the abusers stop. Um, a couple of things not to say, um, but everyone has arguments, don't they? In that one, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, I Okay, okay, look. This one, I hated this one. Okay, I hated this one. It sounds like you two are both as bad as each other. Oh. Yeah, yeah, because I'm busy. Anyways, don't say it. It's not good. You hear somebody else say a punch. No, that's not good. <laughs> don't do that. That's violence. Don't do that. <laughs> so here's the National <laughs> Domestic Violence Hotline. Um, I hope that, you know, they've done great work and they've reached out, then, you know, they really made their presence known. They even have a cool website where, you know, it has an escape button on there. Visited it many times. Violence can escape when someone tries to leave. So here are the things to keep in mind for victims who are considering leaving. You know, keep any evidence of physical abuse, such as pictures um, of their injuries, so that they um, can possibly go to an emergency room, have the emergency room document their injuries, so that they can have a medical record of this stuff somewhere. Um, Keep a journal of violent incidences, can keep it safe somewhere, um, and even the threats made. So, the National Domestic Violence Hotline, they can help with a plan, uh, whatever your situation is, whether you have a cat that you're afraid of leaving, or a little baby that, you know, how am I going to escape with my baby? You're pregnant, um, if you have a disability, they can help you with those things if you reach out. That's me. <laughs> that was me before stuff got really bad. So, um, so in my background, um, I grew up in a single parent household. My father was in prison a majority of my childhood. My mom raised me. 
And though she was the child of a Baptist minister, she didn't adhere to religion strictly, but she did believe in God. She told me to believe in God, and you know, we would pray on occasion. Often talked about me growing up, we would attend church, kind of, but you know, it would always fall off because my mom worked midnights as a nurse assistant, so she was usually tired. I get it. Um, when I was 10, one of my aunts, her next older sister, became a Jehovah's Witness. And she had so much zeal about being a Jehovah's Witness that my mom was like, oh, okay, yeah, we'll study with you too. Um, during those studies, they just talked about the end of the world coming, it was this end of the system of things, and that shit scared me so much. So, kind of like gearing off of religion. Um, and like I said, my father wasn't around. So, senior year of high school, I met the male who would eventually become my husband. Because my mother was, and I got, that's a whole other story, she was really smothering, really verbally abusive. Um, around the age of 18, I decided that I was going to go off to the Air Force with him. He was going to go off to the Air Force. But um, before we went off to the Air Force, he, well, he had a family church and we joined that church. And I was baptized at that church. Um, we had our arguments, we had our tussles, I didn't think much of it. We were young, and that's what young people do. He loved me. He was going off to the military, and he was going to take me with him. I was going to get away from my mom and my crazy family, and we would be joined in holy matrimony as husband and wife, and I was going to be a mother and had the idyllic life um, that I always wanted. That's something that he and I discussed, because he grew up in a single mother household, too, so we wanted to be that kind of... So okay. So, point is, this man abused everything. He abused me, the children, the dog, the cat. Once he abused everything. Um, one of the first times he put his hands on me uh, was in the dorm room in Okinawa. Once we got over there, we were stationed at Kadena Air Force Base. Um, and I don't even know what we were arguing about, but I do remember waking up. We had an argument in the bedroom. I woke up in the bathroom on the floor. Apparently, it choked me unconscious. Um, Oh. After, yeah, after um, I had our first child, he really became possessive. There was a young woman in the Navy who was living her best life, you know, and doing what young women do when they're in the military. And he would just talk so bad about her. And I remember I was sitting on bed, I was bottle feeding her son, and I was like, well, if I was young and single, I'd probably be out there hanging with her. Wrong thing to say. Because he took that as me meaning that I didn't want the family that he had or that the life that he was he was providing me. So like I said, I was bottle feeding my son. He took the bottle and just started pouring it in the baby's face. Just Aww. pouring it all over the baby and he's crying. So I'm a mom, I go and smack his hand, like, what is she doing? And that's when he picked me up and choked me up and slammed me on the ground, slammed my head into the dresser, oh. some glass got broken. I remember I cut my toe, I still got scabbed. So the military police were called and we were separated for a week. And instead of sending me home, they ordered us to go to marriage counseling. Oh. <sighs> so, you know, um, and you know what? At the time, I didn't want to go home because I didn't want to go back to my mom. So it's like, I stay here, I'll go back to my mom and her craziness. So, and I didn't want to be a single mom because, you know, religiously, I didn't want to be a single mom. So, you know, I stayed. I was still believed in a dream. Things didn't get better, but they weren't bad all the time. They are rarely bad all the time. In a in domestic abuse relation, it was not bad all the time. There were some good times, just enough to make it seem like things would be okay. We had another son, but the abuse continued. He eventually was kicked out the Air Force, and we were sent back home to Detroit. He got kicked out for a super reason. I was stupid. So I mean, yeah, I, I got a job right away, and so did he, but with the cost of daycare and everything, um, it just wasn't, I got paid more of the job that I was hired into, so he decided to be a stay at home dad. And by stay at home dad, that meant that the kids were just there all day, barely eating, just eating Cheerios, and he played video games all day. Oh. Yeah, so um, the boys were being watched, and that's all right. I was new to the corporate world, so of course, you know, I'm, I want to wear blazers, and I want to look the part, but he told me that I look stupid in makeup, and I look stupid with lipstick. Um, <laughs> I wasn't allowed to go out with coworkers after work, you know, just to catch a drink or just to catch up and have some release time. He told me I need to tell him two weeks in advance that he had to babysit the kids. So you don't babysit your own kids. Um, our arguments used to last for hours. Like, he wouldn't even let me go to sleep um, if he still had felt like he had a problem with me. He would say, you always have something more important to do than talk to me at 4.30 in the morning, and I had to go to work the next day. I'm like, yeah, let me go to sleep. So that's another form of like sleep deprivation. Because if I went to sleep, then you'll pour water on my face or something. Um, 
Around this time, I started self-harming. I started cutting. Um, it felt good to me to take control of the pain that I was feeling because I could take the pain that I felt on the inside and put it on the outside. I was sneaking to the bathroom and do it, and I cut my chest and my thighs. Um, time went on, and I remember the first time that I had an idea to get a college degree. Um, that was vetoed by him. He shot that down unless we went to school for the same thing, graphic design. I don't, it's funny, I'm working IT now, I get computers, but he wanted to go to school for graphic design. And it's fine, because where I was working, they said, some degree is better than no degree, so just go get one. Um, and so we started college together, and it wasn't long before I realized that the reason that he wanted us to go to school for the same thing was so I could do his homework for him. <laughs> well, when I did, there were consequences. Whatever, any degree is better than no degree, and we eventually got our associate degree. I finished up actually in the labor and delivery room um, nursing our daughter because I had a paper due that week and I was about to not um, graduate because I was in the labor. Duh. Um, he was all done with school after he got his associate's degree and I wasn't. And he threw a fit about that. You, you know, well, you're not going to want to be with somebody who doesn't have their bachelor's like you. That insecurity that he was trying to project on me. So anyway, school, kids, being the only one working, I was exhausted. One of the things that my husband and I used to do was watch this show called Heroes. I don't know if you remember this show. Yeah, was here, right? Siler, Siler too. So one night, his sister was over um, at the house visiting with the kids. But I was just too tired. It was too much, and I just wanted to go to bed. I went to Rome and started getting ready to go to sleep. And for some reason, that just irked him. He was pissed off about it. Um, I guess he really needed me to watch that show with him, spend that quality time. Um, he came into the room and said, let's have a pillow fight. I'm like, yeah, no, I just want to go to sleep. So he picked up the pillow, and he smacked shit out of me with it. And I'm like, okay, okay. So I picked up the pillow and hit him back. That made him mad. So now he's beating me with pillows and beating me into the bed with the pillows. And like on top of my head, with my face down, smothering me with the pillow into the bed. And eventually that just led to him sodomizing me with the door open. And... The children were still weak. So they're running by and they could see what was happening in the room and I'm screaming. And like I said, the sister was there and she just came and like across the door. Uh, oh. mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I guess my screams was bothering her. Um, the next day after everything that happened, after I cried myself to sleep, I'm in the kitchen. And she said, I don't care what you guys do, but don't disrespect me like that. Next time, close the door. Oh. Yeah, she wouldn't believe nothing that her brother did was wrong. Um, also, I used to be an avid nightly news watcher. One night a story came on the television that, you know, really messed me up. A one-year-old baby girl in Ann Arbor, Michigan, I think. I think it was Ann Arbor, Michigan. It was somewhere in Michigan, close to where I live. Um, she was raped by her mother's boyfriend, which... Thank you. I didn't want to do the thing because I didn't think it was going to do the um, Yeah, so I cried really hard when I saw that news story about the baby because she was just so messed up. And I followed the story, and I was crying about it. And that's when, for as religious kind of as I was, I was like, yeah, there's no God. There's no God that could have let that happen. That happened to this baby. You know, how could you let that happen? What purpose would that serve? And so I'm crying, and my then husband asked me what's wrong. And I told him about the news story and how I was feeling. And he told me that I was wrong for being mad at God, that I would be punished forever doubting God. I don't even know why I tried to tell him anything. Because he always betrayed my confidence. Um, one time, because we're married, I told him personal secrets and things that was going on with me. And he called his uncle and told on me. And then his uncle called me to try to counsel me about this stuff. It's like, why are you telling me, your uncle? It is just to embarrass me. So I was mad at God. Um, and he told my mother on me. And then my mom told my aunts on me. And one of the aunts that was church God in Christ, and the other one was still the job witness, um, they both called me angry because I was mad at God. You can't do that, and 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 um, and that I should keep my faith for my children and my family and my salvation. The Jehovah Witness aunt circled back and offered to do Bible study with me, so I took her up on the offer because you know what? I cannot not believe in God. Who does that? Um, so I didn't want to go to hell. Bible study went on for a few weeks, and uh, what I was learning was kind of interesting stuff I had learned in the Bible before. Jehovah Witnesses have a way of making the Bible. <laughs> The matter of fact and applicable to life somehow. <laughs> they, they're really good at their craft. Um, 
So I asked my husband to join the studies for a few weeks, and he declined, saying that I needed the study more than he did. Then, my then husband, then he finally did come to Bible study. Because there was a male present now, my aunt couldn't do the Bible study anymore. So we were assigned to an older couple um, in our local area. And though my husband still showed little more than casual interest in Bible study, he never did the watch shower lessons that we were supposed to do. He never led the family in um, personal Bible study. He still loved to check me by physically choking me when I was not being a submissive wife. I confided in the wife of the Bubby's Bible study leader, and she told me not to worry, just to keep belief in Jehovah and to remember 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be one without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe their chaste and respectful behavior. And that was some bullshit. Because now, <laughs> that shit don't hurt. <laughs> so, now I'm still self-harming. I'm still cutting. Still believing that God is not doing anything for me. And one time I locked myself in the bathroom because he was talking shit again. And I knew that it was going to get to the point where we was going to get into it. So, I go into the bathroom. And this mother... He called the EMS on me. And told them that I was trying to kill myself. And like, they took me away in the ambulance and put me in a hospital on suicide watch, cuffed me to the stretcher. The nurse, one of the nurses that was there, asked me, what was so wrong that I would try to kill myself? And I was like, I wasn't trying to kill myself. I cut it. I'm like, there's a difference. <laughs> and she was like, um, I was like, well, apparently I'm crazy. I got to be here. And she was like, you're not crazy. You're just tired of the situation that you're in. Ding, 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 light bulb. And I still had to go to the psych facility for 48 hours afterwards. And then his little punk ass gonna pull up and pick me up and take me home just smug about it. Piece of shit. So when I got home, <laughs> right, look at that. He deserved everything he got home to. Anyway, so when I got home, I really started researching gods and religion, especially Christian religions. And that's what I did instead of prayer. The prayer that I was advised to do, I started reading and using my brain, right? I started reading about Charles Taylor Russell, the founder of the Jehovah Witnesses, and how they were super racist. They thought that blacks were less intelligent than whites. And so I told them, mm -hmm, look it up. <laughs> I told the person that we were studying with about this, and she was like, shh, don't bring that up. Bring that up. You know, God makes a way. He, he makes the light brighter as you go forward. Oh, right. right. So <laughs> after a while, we ended up changing studying partners, this time to a younger couple. After researching what I researched, um, as well as having to be the one to lead family Bible study that he was supposed to do, I just stopped going to the hall. I started canceling studies, and one weekend, the white wife of the couple um, we were studying with stopped by. She asked, why did I stop going to the hall, and why did I stop studying? Um, I told her that I didn't believe anymore. None of it really sat right with me. She said that if we stopped studying, that God would kill our kids soon, because this end of the system of things was going to happen soon. And I said, if you want me to worship a guy that would kill my kids over something I did, fuck your guy. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I'm still researching, and they all had the same pattern of misogyny and bloodshed and contradictions. And, you know, you got to be in our exclusive club. You got to believe in our God and nobody else is to get saved. And I was just like, you know what? I'm not even mad at God. I just don't believe shit. It's, it's over now. And I was, but then I was mad. Because I was deceived for so long. You know, some of us go through that. You, know, you start breaking from bed and I'm just mad about everything. Like, I've been lying to my ass for all this time. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I started finding non believer groups online <laughs> and, and, you know, other black non believer groups. Um, and I was all militant at first, posting anti religious <laughs> stuff all over my page and engaging in arguments with believers. Like, that got me anywhere. <laughs> and I forgot that my aunt's hairdresser was my friend on Facebook, and they're super religious. So then he told my auntie on me, and then she was like, you shouldn't post that kind of stuff on Facebook. And I said, so the believers get to post their stuff, and I'm going to get blocked. Blocked her, too. And blocked him, too. So, okay, real quick, in the fall of 2012, I graduated with my bachelor's degree in business, because I said I was still going to school. We went to Olive Garden. Yes! <laughs> so we went to Olive Garden. Because you know that's the place to celebrate. <laughs> and while we <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, um, oh wait, my mom here. Y'all touch the thing. She pushed the screen. Why y'all push the thing so many times? I don't have a right. No, I think so. Yeah. No! Okay, so I got my bachelor's degree. I got my bachelor's 
bachelor's degree. And while we were there at Olive Garden celebrating, my son told me something, and then his father was also sitting there, and I just heard this big thump, and I saw it. He had punched my son in the chest. Oh, he punched my son in the chest because, you know, he felt like he got in trouble with something, so that was the right way to reprimand him. We had a dog who loved me, wagged his tail with excitement when I came home, and he started punching and kicking the dog. Like, my mother got me a cat for my birthday. And I was on the phone negotiating my salary with a lady from my job, and he was trying to get my attention. I was just like, hold on a second. So he threw my cat into the wall. Like, he just abused everything. So, yeah. Um, all of this madness, I'm feeling lower than low. And in the quiet, I realized that the only one that could get my, myself and the kids out of the situation uh, was me. None of the males in my family were going to save me. My brother was on my husband's side. He was on my husband. I feel so sorry you have to deal with Keita. So if I stayed, he was going to hurt my son more, move on to the next kid. My sons would grow up to think that that's how you're supposed to treat women. My daughter would think that that's the way she's supposed to be treated. And intentionally or not, he was going to end up killing me. It could have been accidental. I could have failed. He could have accidentally broke my neck, or he was just going to do it on purpose. Um, on May 31st, 2013, he and I got into an argument about something. We always argue about something. And he took my cell phone and threw it at me so hard that it left a big old bruise on my left bicep. Walked I walked out the door, grabbed my keys. I left my kids there that night because I had to go and drove to my mother's house and told her what happened. Um, the next morning, I went to my mother's leasing, because uh, she lived in an apartment, I went to the leasing office and inquired about getting a, an apartment. And they approved me for an apartment that day. And I went back, I got my kids, and that's where we <laughs> lived for the next three months. No furniture, nothing. I had to start up, I couldn't take anything. But yeah. we were away, and I slept on, we slept on the floor for three months. We had to eat the little monitor TV. But that's what you gotta do. When you have to leave, you have to leave. I'm not gonna leave and go to another house. You just have to go. Um, just whatever you can do. Um, wrapping up, yeah, so that summer after I left, didn't have too many problems out of him for some reason, unfortunately, which made me nervous. But that summer was one of the best summers that we had. Like I said, we slept on the floor. We started um, going everywhere. This is our apartment that we live in. I eventually got a diamond table, but then that was the most furniture we had. We went to Mississippi. Those are the cats that he abused, and I saved them that we have them with us. And we just lived our life. We went everywhere. We did everything. We went to Chicago here, the Navy here. And two years after I left home, we were able to buy a house. Wow. <laughs> this part, I didn't want to wrap up without talking about my girl, Angie, who's actually from Chicago, was living in Phoenix. <laughs> Um, my story has a happy ending, but not everyone's story has a happy ending because Angelina uh, was a homegirl, 33-year-old mother of three. She was a legal secretary who had plans to go to law school. We met in a black women's heathens group on Facebook, and she had already began, you know, began filling out her applications, writing her application essays, but she had to postpone going to law school because um, we know money. On the, eight, on the night of April 13, 2014, Angelina was shot and killed by her husband. He then fled the scene and was found dead after an apparent murder I mean, after a parent suicide later on that night. Angie was found by police in their apartment along with her children who were safe. Police believed that the children were sleeping at the time and did not witness the murder. Now, Angie had told us, you know, she was worried that her husband might be a danger to her, her children, or himself. He was seeing a therapist um, that was diagnosed as being suicidal. Before she was killed, Angelina had posted a picture to her group, smiling, saying that she had finally submitted the petition for divorce. Mm -hmm. I was at work when I found out, and I saw people posting goodbye and RIP on her page, and I was just in shock. Everyone in the group was shocked. And then I went through a period of survivor's remorse, where it's kind of like you like one of those people that just barely missed getting on one of the planes that crashed into the Twin Towers or something. You're like, well, how did I make it out? And she didn't. We were like in this together. We were almost there. Um, nicely enough, one of the members of the group, she um, started a trust fund for her children, which we all contributed to, and that's great, but it doesn't bring back Angie. She should be at this event right now. She was from Chicago. She should be here with me up here talking about surviving domestic violence. Um, she should be here with her kids. She should be graduating from law school, and we should still be talking shit on Facebook and teasing her about how she liked to drink Modelo Blacks for some reason, weirdo. <laughs> and we should have been able to meet each other in real life. In her casket was not the first place I was ever supposed to see her in person. Um, this is serious. Look out for your friends. If you notice something off, ask them about it. Remind them that there is hope. They don't have to stay. Leaving is scary, but so is staying. Pick your scary. Be a thug and be a warrior about it.
bet there are several people listening to me right now who are currently being abused or who were abused or who are abusers themselves. Abuse could be affecting your daughter, your sister, your friend right now. Talk to someone. I'm breaking the silence today. It's my way of helping my sisters and it's my appeal to you. Um, talk about my story. Talk about Angie. Talk about um, abuse thrives in silence and disbelief. You have the ability to help end domestic violence by putting a light on it and listening. Victims need us. Um, bring the topic of domestic violence to light by talking about it with your children, your coworkers, your friends, and your family. Show survivors that show that survivors are awesome, lovable people with bright futures ahead of them. Recognize the early signs of violence and carefully intervene to ensure victims a safe way out. Thank you for listening to me. kids but she looked like their big sister but when she would tell me about what she was going through I would work all day but I would be dealing I was going to go home and not know the condition of this young lady and her four beautiful kids every time she called me I was there see this, this women thing is serious to me I never got abused physically, but I'd be down if I'm going to be part of this movement and say, if you need me, call me, and then I get the call, and I'm not there. We ate together. We broke bread together. I got the couch and came over. She got the couch. couch. <laughs> I've been in her beautiful new house sitting on the quiet neighbor, tree-lined neighborhood. She did that with very little support from her mother. Her, her kids are my secular grandchildren. I'm serious. I don't play. But see, we got the those who do and those who watch others do. I'm a doer. And if I'm rolling with you, we together till the wheels fall off. Now, I don't want to find out what happens when the wheels fall off. But if that's what it takes from beginning to end, that's how I roll. I roll like that with Marquita. I roll like that with Mandisa. I roll like, like that with Sanja. I roll like that with Sakibu. I'm in it to win it. And if you're not, don't come to me. Because I surround myself by warriors. We all have moments of weakness. And when I'm weak, I need my sisters and the women in this community come and lift me up. And if you can't do that, because I'm not going to ask for your strength. I, that's just not who I am. My pride won't allow that. But if you know me and you see me and I'm down, lift me up. Because I'm going to do it for you. She's more than a pretty face. She's no longer a survivor. She's a fucking thriver. Because I've seen it with myself. I've seen these kids go through shit. With that maniacal man that she used to be married to. This little dirty, dirtball piece of waste of skin who couldn't take that she was growing and he was diminished by his own hand and his own mouth. This is not a game for me. I love women. I'm passionate about women. Why? Because I didn't have this growing up. I didn't have a mother to affirm me. So if any chance I can affirm one woman, it's a done deal. So I be who? Man, woman, however you identify, non-binary, queer, however you identify, don't leave here talking about how inspired you were and in two days like you back to the same fuck shit. Yep. Yep. Shit, get off that pot. That's what this is about. Beyond belief. Beyond our limited circumstances, beyond who you think you are, be a difference, make a difference, and stop this woe is me. Because trust me, there is somebody who needs you, even in your mess. I was fucked up, but this woman needed me. And I had an hour commute to get home. But when I hear her voice, I stop, drop, and roll. 
And we all should have that commitment. If you are saying you are going to make a difference in this community, whatever part of this community you in, make a difference. Actually do something and stop talking. Beyond belief. Beyond love, beyond compassion, get beyond yourself. Because I don't know what would have happened had I sat on my ass and said, oh, I'll just check on her when I get home. And that man could have shot her brains out and the children and the cats. He didn't care. He didn't. But I can personally attest to what I see. How he would embarrass her when she's trying to be a co-organizer. How she's trying to be that good mother. And he did his best. To break her. And look at her today. She just got her master's degree. <laughs> we don't know what we're going through, but let's talk. Let's network. Let's communicate. Let's thrive together. Yeah. We can do that. Ran over. <laughs> Thank you.